Welcome back, everybody. Dog Bone Podcast. I think we're up to number 98. We're closing in on the old 100. Uh, kind of a benchmark for us that we've been aiming at for a while. So we're getting there. Um, this week, what we're going to do, or this podcast, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, uh, recent events, most recent events here, uh, have spurred some comments, have spurred some feedback um, and a lot of questions actually. So I thought we'd just do a podcast on it, did a post on it uh, recently. Today is Tuesday and coming off the weekend, we had a real nice weekend up north. Um, we, we went up to the cabin and with intentions of doing some grouse hunting, maybe a little bit of ice fishing depending on the ice conditions. And we did that. We struggled. Well, actually, you and I on Saturday, we flushed 14 birds. Mm -hmm. So we, we moved some birds. Uh, we missed. They are a humbling animal. The, the, the king is what I'm talking about here. Uh, grouse, they, they can humble the finest of wing shooters. We had some pretty nice opportunities that we did not connect on. It's also kind of interesting, too. We haven't been bird hunting. Ben and I have been deer hunting primarily for the last uh, month and a half, at least. Closer, maybe even to... Yeah, probably a month and a half. Um, and when you stop shooting, um, you know, shooting shooting anything, I think, whether it be ducks, grouse, pheasants, whatever it is, there is a cadence, a rhythm that goes with it. Um, you, we got in a little, I, I personally felt like I really got into a little bit of a groove in October um, and, and was connecting on quite a few birds. And I think a lot of it had to do with different scenarios, the different covers, as the leaves fell down, it, it made things a little bit easier. It also made it harder because we got off the trails and when we walked on the trails, um, my shooting percentage was much higher when you get off the trails because you just struggle to get into position to make a good shot. You're in the brush, your your footwork is off, it's just, it's a lot harder. So anyway, we, we went back and did some late season grouse hunting this last weekend. And I did it the weekend before as well. And the reason being uh, very minimal snow up north. It's been cold, but not not any snow. And so when there's no snow, it makes it um, huntable yet, uh, a lot easier to get through the woods. So Ben and I decided we were gonna try that. So we did, um, and we had this buddy Tori come up as well. And so on Saturday, we did pretty well. I mean, we covered a lot of ground. First off, we weren't in nearly as good a shape as we were in October. I wasn't anyway. Um, what was six or seven miles felt like 14 or 15. And so it was, it was a little bit of a challenge. Um, Sunday we went out and we went into some covers that I thought we, we kicked a few birds around, but we, we got into some snowshoe hair and we've done this in the past a little bit up there. We shot one earlier this year as they were going from brown to white. The snowshoe hair changes colors um, in the winter. Really a unique animal, really cool animal, big rabbit, nothing like a cottontail um, as far as size goes. And obviously cottontails don't turn colors, they stay brown. So there's a, a distinct advantage to that snowshoe hair um, when there's snow on the ground, but there's a pretty big disadvantage to him right now when there's no snow on the ground because he really stuck out. Um, and so we, we were hunting grouse with the dogs and I had, I hunted Spry and Taylor together on Saturday. I hunted uh, Bella and Ellie together on Sunday. And Sunday, we, well, Saturday too, I guess, uh, you got one on Saturday, a, a snowshoe, and we were able to um, send the dog, it, treat it basically, what, what we do is, and everyone kind of does their own thing. We have it set up, we, we kind of establish this rule of you don't shoot rabbits when we're grouse hunting, because, especially in a group, because there's multiple, multiple hunters, there's mul typically multiple dogs on the ground, and we just don't risk the idea of them um, shooting uh, and, and having an accident with the dog. So we don't shoot typically rabbits while we're grouse hunting. Um, the exception would be when it's a smaller group, when there's less of us, uh, when we have a better handle on all the guns and where the dogs are. And so it was just Ben and I. So we said, okay, we'll shoot rabbits if we want, if you want to, we'll shoot rabbits today, but we're gonna stop the dogs to the whistle. So when you see the rabbit, you call out, you know, there's a rabbit up ahead and I'll stop the dogs to the whistle wherever they are quartering. 
I have gotten into a habit of hunting the two dogs together. Um, typically when it's Bella, I heal one dog and I quarter the other. So it was Bella and Ellie this, this time. We hunted one out, quartering in front, and the other healed. So I took turns with them. Um, Taylor and Spry hunted actually together most of the time. So when we do that, when I've only got one dog out in front of me, it's real easy for me to keep tabs. When I've got two dogs out in front of me, I can keep tabs of them pretty well. More than two, I can't. So I don't hunt more than two together myself. Um, but when we did it, we, we had on Saturday, um, when Ben shot that snowshoe, we had just flushed a grouse. And uh, so we kind of, the bird flushed. I stopped the dogs to the whistle at that point. We did not get the bird. So I stopped the dogs. We called them back and shortly after, like minutes after, a couple minutes after, before we even started moving, a, a snowshoe got out in front of us and Ben said, there's a rabbit in front. I said, okay, go ahead and shoot. Dogs are with me on heel. And so he ended up shooting it um, and I sent, I sent Spry on that. So it ended up becoming like a blind retrieve for her. Now, I think, you know, people are gonna, ask, I do, I've had people ask me, you know, aren't you worried about you're sending your dog to pick up these rabbits, now they're gonna chase rabbits. Well, so I don't, here's why. Now I think you could get into that. Like Bella uh, is very much um, high, high predator chase. She's, she's a predator prey mode all the time. Um, she chases hard. So I have to understand and recognize that. Now Taylor, Taylor will bump into a rabbit. I saw her do it on Saturday. Uh, she literally bumped one out of a log, nose to nose with the rabbit. The rabbit ran, it was right in front of me. Rabbit ran off. She looked, watched it run off and she just kept going about her business working. Um, we were grouse hunting. She, she knew that she, we weren't chasing rabbits. Now, if I sent her on a retrieve for a rabbit, she would have picked it up. I'm sure of that. Now she's picked rabbits up before. Ellie has picked up rabbits before. We've hunted um, Ellie behind beagles where we let the beagles run the rabbits. And I, in those situations, I 100% just heal the dog. Um, that's something that we're planning on doing here later this, this winter, actually. We're gonna run beagles on the snowshoes, which is a lot better chase. The, the cottontails hole up pretty quick, especially here. There's a lot of brush that they'll get into here. And so the chases are pretty short usually. The dog might get one loop out of them and then they're gonna be, and it's not a big loop and they're into a hole or into a brush pile and we're not getting them out. So the snowshoe is different. The snowshoe will run bigger loops. Um, the snowshoe won't go to a hole right away. Uh, a lot better chase, a lot better hunt with the beagles. And so we're gonna be doing that later. Uh, this winter. This weekend, we did not hunt over beagles. Um, would have loved to, but we, we didn't have them with us. So, but in the past, what we've done is run those dogs and keep the dog on heel, and we just use them for picking up. So they just retrieve. And Ellie, the first time she did it, struggled. Uh, we filmed this, we posted it. I don't know if it's on YouTube or not, but it was on, it's on our social media for sure. But we, we ran the cottontails and sent her to make a retrieve and she ran right by it, smelled it, and then kept hunting. And I don't think she realized that I actually wanted her to pick it up. So we had to encourage her to do it a little bit. And so we, it was one of those Facebook moments, or, or it was Facebook at the time, I don't even know if we were on Instagram at that time, where we, I went and encouraged her to pick it up. Once she, once, I mean, I literally, like she literally ran over it a couple times and did, knew it was there, just didn't think that was what she was supposed to pick up. So then I ended up going up to her, encouraging her to pick it up. Finally, she picked it up. I got real excited. She, it kind of clicked with her and she understood. She brought it back to me like two or three steps. I took it and threw it, the rabbit, and I healed her back and I sent her on it like it was a memory. She picked it up and brought it back to me. From that point on, every rabbit we shot, she picked up nicely. Um, so it just, it needed to click. It needed, it was an opportunity for us to get some training in the field and that's what we did. Now with these dogs this weekend, we didn't have that issue. I don't think Spry has ever picked up fur before. I don't think she's ever picked up a rabbit. This was her first chance. She handled it really well, surprisingly maybe really well, um, but no hesitation. And we later on as we hunted, we did not run into, like we kicked rabbits out and didn't shoot them. Um, again, I wasn't gonna shoot a rabbit that was kind of flushed by the dogs. I wouldn't ch shoot a rabbit that dogs were chasing. We were not, for, for not for the reason of worrying about the dog 
chasing them, but for safety more than anything. So whenever we shot hares, they were out by themselves. We knew where the dogs were. The dogs were sitting or by me, you know, sitting remote or next to me in heel position. That's the only time we decided we were going to do it. Now, I'm not saying you have to do it that way. It's certainly not legal or illegal to do it that way. There's no law stuff involved with it. There's no ethics involved, like morals or ethics when it comes to hunting. I'm not saying that it's and that's not the reason we did it. It was just for safety reasons. And I want to make sure that we're not having any accidents with the dogs. So, but for training reasons, I think that is a good way of going about it because I don't necessarily want the dogs to start chasing rabbits. That's not my intentions when I have these dogs picking up fur, when I have them picking up rabbits. I have them picking up because I want then I want, we want all of our game recovered first off. So if we lose one, I want them to be able to find it. And there's a story, a rabbit story back in the day where it was early, early on. I wasn't even hunting the dogs on rabbits at the time, but we, my son had a little snare line that he ran here behind the house one winter in the snow and he was snaring cottontails. And so he caught one. We went out to get it. Um, it wasn't dead. And so as we, he, as I went up to it, the snare broke, the rabbit ran off. I couldn't catch it. I mean, I was like in my socks and underwear trying to get this thing in the snow and I'm not, and it wasn't working. So I told him, I said, go back in the house and get Jet. Jet was a dog that I was training, training. And it wasn't Jet, it was Jeb actually, J-E-B. So I said, go get Jeb. Jeb was a dog that I was training as a tracking dog to track deer. And so we brought Jeb out and I told Jeb to go hunt. I gave him a hunt command. I told him to find it. And he tracked that rabbit, who was kind of out of it a little bit, but he tracked that rabbit out of sight, out of here. I couldn't hear him anymore, breaking through the snow or anything. And it was and he was gone for a couple minutes. And then he came back and he had that rabbit in his mouth. Brought it back to us, caught it, brought it to me. I wrung its neck and next thing you know, we had the rabbit. But it's one of these things where we want to recover every animal. As a hunter, we want to make sure we're recovering everything. So I want them to be trained to pick up game. And the other reason is, is because it saves me a lot of time. It saves me a lot of steps um, as we shoot. And it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's another opportunity for reward for the dog. Um, retrievers retrieve, hunting dogs hunt. That's what I messaged to a guy who sent me a message about, man, that's really cool that you're, you're using these labs to pick up um, to pick up rabbits. And so, and it was actually a message that I got, it was a message, I was messaging back and forth with Gundog Magazine, who we do some, we do a lot of stuff with Gundog Magazine. Um, but that was their message to me. It was, wow, it's really cool that you're using labs for that. And I said, yeah, I, I really believe that hunting dogs hunt and retrievers retrieve. And I think you can get them to do hunt just about anything, retrieve just about anything. I think you gotta be careful though, because I don't want them, like I said, running rabbits. So a lot of that comes back to discipline and control. The idea of being able to stop a dog to the whistle is is real important. Now that would play in whether, I don't care if it's a rabbit or a deer. Like if a deer jumps up, I hear this a lot where people go, well, what if you're pheasant hunting? And this is a lot of times it connects back to collars where they say, well, we I need the collar because I need this insurance. What happens if I jump a deer while we're hunting and it runs across the road, the dog chases the deer across the road and gets hit. And my answer to that is always, you don't have an issue with a, a, a pheasant if, it, if it, you're pheasant hunting and a dog chases a deer you don't have a pheasant dog problem you have a you have a you have a dog problem when it comes to control and obedience if your dog runs away in distracted situations it's not a hunting issue it's a control issue it's an obedience issue so i work the dog and, and I'm prepared. The I'm preparing the dog prior to going into the field to have the ability to stop them in distractions when there's distractions. When a rabbit runs and I don't want him to chase it, what do I do? Say stop, come back here. And if they can't do that, we don't go hunting. So it all comes back to the idea of foundation first, which is why sequentially I don't hunt dogs early. Everyone I, I hear when we talk a lot about hunting dogs early, get them out, get them out, get them out. I think if you don't have a foundation to to build off of, you're building tips over. And so that's the situation is you go too early and you don't have the foundation, you don't have the obedience, you don't have the control in the first place, you're gonna find yourself in a really bad situation, lots of times, which create major issues that persist. Because then we get these dogs that wanna run, then we get these dogs that get all excited, and people get so pumped up about the dog's prey and the drive, most dogs have more than you can handle in the first place. So make sure you establish 
a foundation, a building block, a, an area that, you know, early on prior to getting them in these positions. Now, Bella is Bella's a prime example of it. If, if it were six months ago, I would not be hunting Bella the way I'm hunting her right now. And you watch Bella be good the series, you'll see that. When she was a year old, it was probably 10 months to 12 months old where we were having some issues with her because she was getting so bird driven because we were releasing all these pheasants and she was catching them. And because she was catching them, I was losing that control of her. So we focused and said, we cannot, we have to firm up. We cannot allow her to have this freedom where she can just run off and get rewarded by catching these birds. Well, we focused not on bird hunting at that point. We focus, I said, hell, she's got it. I know she's got it in her, look at that. What we need to do is figure out how to, how to take control of the situation and have her work the way we want her to as opposed to, to the way she wants to instinctively or naturally. You remember what, we, what we're doing with retriever training. So I, Ben brought up the idea before, we we're gonna talk a little bit about how, you know, the versatility involved with, with what we're doing. I think, labs are real versatile. There's the term versatile hunting dog. And I don't mean this in any disrespect to any versatile hunting dog people out there, but I think labs are extremely versatile. I think the GSPs are versatile. I think the, the uh, draw tars, they're all the, name the dogs in the versatile hunting dog world, you know, classification that have that badge. Well, yeah, they're versatile, but so are all the retrievers. So are all the hounds. So are like dogs are versatile. That's what I think. And so it depends on how you use them and choose to use them. But when you think about the idea of what we're doing with retrievers, re we are going against a lot of the things that they do naturally. When you talk about pointing dogs, and I'm getting into pointing dogs more and more, I'm getting deeper into it because I'm gonna have one. And next spring we're getting one. So I'm looking at that and I'm, my takeaway to this point right now, and it's easy to say because I don't have one, but is, there, you rely so much on instinct with them when it comes to the hunting part of it. Now we're talking about the hunting part, not the foundation. The foundation I don't believe is any different for any dog, regardless of species or breed. So, but when you're talking about the actual in the field hunting, I think that these pointing dogs are so instinctive and natural. We're not training them to do it, we're bringing it out. With a retriever, yes, we are bringing out natural retrieve, but no, we are not relying on their natural instincts to a large degree when it comes to what we're asking to do typically when we're hunting. Now, when I say that, you're gonna go, what do you mean? Like, you know, you always talk about how it's important to have genetics and the inherent traits. It is for game finding. We don't teach dogs to game find. We don't teach dogs to use their nose. I think that is a very natural thing. It's a very instinctive thing. It's a very bred in thing. It's a trait that they have. Trainability is very tr is very bred into them. Intelligence is bred into them. Willingness to please, biddability. Those are all things that are bred into them for sure. But when you think about the physical stuff that we're asking of them, steadiness, the ability to mark. Now I think there's some. I think there is some intuitive things there that the dogs have inherently. I think we accent and bring out and sharpen their ability to mark using certain techniques and drills. So marking, I think, is very much a skill that we, that we train into the dog that I don't know what's 100% natural. The idea of steadiness is not natural. Dogs are not built to be steady. The retrievers are not built to be steady naturally. We do that through training it goes against some of the things that they're asked to do. Lining, running straight lines is not a natural thing for a dog to do. We train that into them. We train them in to handle. Handling is not a natural thing. Dogs don't aren't born with the skill to say, you can give me directions using your hands. You can stop, stopping to a whistle is not natural. That's control. That's, that's very fundamental foundational obedience. And it goes against what a dog naturally does. Dogs do not naturally stop and look for direction from you. They, they are built to find stuff, go search things out. But when we start altering that natural behavior as a retriever and a trainer of retrievers, we're doing it to fit what we want them to do and what we need them to do. It's the tools that they, are, they become tools in a game or a hunt or a work situation, and we customize them as tools. We're, we're, we're building them to perform the way we want. And why do we do all that stuff? Well, for hunting purposes, yes, but when you think about you know, field trials, field trials are, originally they started out to be 
kind of like hunting. I don't think they are much like hunting myself, but they we're ask it's we ask dogs to do certain things to fit a mold, to fit to fit a competition or a certain thing that we as humans are judging them on, not necessarily success in the field from a hunting standpoint. So that's a totally different rabbit hole, literally, but or pun, pun intended there. But so, but what we when we start talking about this style of hunting that we did this weekend, working them on to pick up rabbits for us, I really think it's a great opportunity to have another layer. First off, it's another use for them. It's another. It's a lot of fun. I mean, rabbit hunting for me would not be any fun if we didn't have dogs involved. I, I don't think I would shoot rabbits if we didn't have dogs involved, both beagles for, ch for the chase and retrievers for the picking. So it's no different for me, and that's me personally, it's no different than ducks. I, I would not go duck hunting. Maybe I'd go uh, occasionally. I wouldn't go very often if I did, if there weren't dogs involved. I you know I hunted um, Ben and I did some layout boat hunting and it was really fun. It was really interesting. Um, the biggest thing I probably took away from it was man, there's no dogs involved and it's nowhere near as fun to me. Like I'm not that. I don't get that much enjoyment out of shooting a duck. I really get enjoyment out of shooting a duck and having my dog retrieve it. So that's just a, you know, the, 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 the idea of incorporating the dogs is a big, big benefit for me from a, well, I mean, who was it that picked up the squirrel? Was it Spry? I shot a, I shot a black squirrel while we were out. I mean, we did not find any grouse. We, no. we were not shooting many grouse. So, but I shot a black squirrel and I think Spry retrieved it. I sent her, she picked it up, brought it back. So again, I'm not shooting small game unless I have the dog with, and the dog's picking and making retrieves. Again, now we're back to versatility. Like I've never trained the dog on squirrels, I've never trained the dog on rabbits, but we've trained such fundamentals into the dog that I feel very confident that we can transition it and, and make it work with our training with some maybe some subtle changes, and that's subtle changes at, at, at the most. Now. The idea of what we're doing, some you know, for some of you might think it's a little odd or a little strange or kind of cool. I, I've had a lot of people comment back of with questions of explain to me a little bit what you're doing here with these dogs and rabbit hunting. I've had a lot of really positive feedback where it was like, man, that's really cool. I've had a lot of questions of what are you doing with them, like what I you know, are you eating them? What are you doing with these animals? So we're gonna talk about that in a second. But the other thing that that is interesting is you know it's not you really that unique what we're doing in fact if you think about the origins of our dogs um you the uk um the british style dog they this is very this is was 100 percent natural to what they're doing over there i shouldn't say natural but it's comparable um as far as a walk up so you know walked up with the dogs on heel off lead uh, had shooters, gunners, a line of shooting, shot animals, sent the dogs. All the all the retrieves were blinds because none of the dogs saw any of the of the rabbits. So they all became blind retrieves, and they, a couple of them needed to be handled a little bit. I needed to handle Bella into an area. Her line wasn't real good. The thing that was real challenging about it, which was fun, which made it made it fun for me and the dogs, was because it was challenging, and the challenge was partially the environment like we were in cutovers or you know clear cuts um 15 20 year old aspen cuts that were thick i mean you want to talk about some stem density they are thick and so to send a dog on a line it goes back to some of our training and it's interesting because we do so much training in open fields we do so much training along field edges fence lines we do all this stuff to try to help steer our dog i always use it, i always say it's like drawing a line with a ruler we it's a lot easier to do with the ruler and straight edge as opposed to freehand so it's a lot harder to do it without that straight edge well when we sent these dogs and you'll see this in some of the videos because we did some recording of it I mean, it's like a wall of Aspen. Like there is no line there. So when you send the dog out, they have to carry a line relatively straight in order to get into the area of where the animal is. And it's really difficult for them to navigate through that thick, thick popple cuttings. So, but it's no, but they're used to it. I, my dogs are used to it because we've been hunting in them all fall. That's where we hunted grouse and woodcock all fall. So. If we had not been in that, in those scenarios and situations, and, and quite honestly, when we sent the dogs on the blinds, I'm trying to think back on all the retrieves that we made. 
none of them hunted short, I don't think. In fact, some, most of them overran. So the retrieves that we were sending on were anywhere from as close as 30 yards to probably out to 60, 70 yards from where the rabbit was from where I sent it. And the dog never once hunted short. Now Bella did fade off once um, and, and she, she got out of line. I had to recall her, stop her to a whistle, handle her to the left, stop her, cast her back. Um, spry, when I sent her through some cover on one of the retrieves, she had to jump over a down pine tree. She had to go up a hill. There was a, I, we were in a swamp and we, we sent her up onto a ridge. So that, that terrain change was a little bit of a challenge for her. She took a really nice line out, but she got out about 25 yards and she stopped and checked back to me. Um, very similar to what we would do, have done in some drills. Now, do I, you know, I don't like that she stopped short. I don't mind that she stopped short. She wasn't 100% sure. She checked back with me. I said, go back. She turned. She ran straight back. She ran over the, over the rabbit, hunted back to it, picked it up, brought it back. So it was really, you know, what it did for us was it gave us a really nice opportunity to extend our training, grow on our training, um, add some versatility to some of the things that we're doing with the dogs, the little bit, I don't even know if I would call them hiccups, but the little, the little miscues that happened, we handled out of. And so it's almost reassuring to me as a handler because I go, the dogs really responded really well. That's exactly what I need them to do. It was 100% unscripted. It was 100% real life. Let's go hunt and we'll make some adjustments as we go. And was it fun? And, and when we were done, so the question a lot of people I think were concerned with, what are you shooting these things for? What, why, why are you shooting them? What are you doing with them? Well, uh, we ate them today. Ben brought them in, we, we cleaned them. So we're gonna clean, we, this, is a, this goes back to, a, I touched on it in another podcast. I made a post about it. I, I, I feel really, really strongly about the idea of understanding because we have a lot of people that follow us surprise maybe surprising maybe not surprising i don't know we have a lot we are growing more and more when it comes to followers especially on instagram but um facebook too i suppose that aren't necessarily hunters it's more they have dogs they're interested in training um they recognize that we train hunting dogs and we do a lot of hunting with our dogs but they don't necessarily do it and that's fine i i don't but i also think it's, it's important to understand what hunting really is. And so hunting, 100%, is not just shooting. It's not just killing. Um, it's not just cool pictures. It's, it's there, it goes from the idea of preparing for the hunt, doing the hunt, completing the hunt, and then finishing the hunt. And I think the finishing part of the hunt is not when you close the tailgate and take pictures. I think it's when, you, when Ben brings the crock pot to work because that's what happened today. So we... I. I, we had a comment that was, I don't know, weeks ago um, regarding a retrieve that we made and some ice for a duck. And one of the comments was, it's just a duck. And I got pissed about it. And I brought, I went on a little rant with my comment back to him. Not in a bad way, but I think it was respectful. But I also think, I hope it was clear that I felt pretty strongly that it's not just a duck. It's not just a rabbit. It's not just a deer. It's a deer. It's a duck. It's a rabbit. And we, as hunters have decided to take its life. And if we do that, uh, it's for a reason. And it's not just to take a picture of it. It's not for fun. It's because we're gonna eat it. And we're gonna fill our freezer with it. And we're gonna eat it over the next year. And so we got, we my, my nephew, a pretty proud uncle moment of mine last week, uh, my nephew went, went, got his first deer. I was with him. Um, he shot a nice doe. A uh, good friend of ours let us go. He has a lot of deer on his property. Let us go on his, go on his land, um, shoot one of his does, and we did. It was a fantastic experience for both myself and my nephew. We brought the deer up north this weekend with us. We knew when we went up there to hunt and fish. Uh, we cut the deer up together as a group. We cut the deer up in my grandpa, my grandpa's old basement, which now is my sister's place, but their their cottage or cabin. Um, but it was my grandpa's old house where I butchered deer when I was probably, I don't even know how, old, barely remember it. But it, so I mean, I was like probably six or seven years old, maybe, um, which would have been 35, you know, 34, 35 years ago. So that was cool. 
to be able to do that again. And we, we did it. My nephew got involved with it. He helped. He thought it was awesome. He had never eaten because his family doesn't, isn't big into hunting. So he had never eaten venison heart before. He had never had steaks before. Off of, He thought eating a deer was summer sausage and hot sticks. And for some people, that's the way it is. And that's fine. I really like venison. And so my family's been raised on venison. Um, we fried up tenderloin, we fried up steaks, we fried up the heart. He ate all of it, he loved it. I mean, there was, you had never had heart, right? Mm -hmm. Tori had never had heart. And both of you guys said, you'll never let that heart go in the gut pile again. I mean, it's, to me, it's one of the delicacies of, of shooting a deer. I think it's fantastic. Um, and, and, but I, again, we, we had this process that we took it through. We cleaned the rabbits. We cleaned some crappies, we cleaned a squirrel, we cleaned a deer. I mean, it was a butcher shop and a half going on in that basement. And we ate like kings and we celebrated and we put, I mean, we had, we had drinks, we had laughs, we had music, we had just a really, really good time. And I think that's an important point to make that that is all part of the hunt. That is 100% part of the entire thing. And it doesn't, it, and so, we talk about, I, I don't know that we talk about it enough. I think we talk about the idea of, oftentimes, and I'm speaking as a hunter, I think oftentimes we talk about the idea of the birds decoying, you know, making a good shot, you know, the great retrieve that the dog, that's all part of it. No question about it. Um, it's all part of it. But. <laughs>